Hello, this is Candy with eyes to Jesus.blogspot.com and welcome as we continue on our study going through the whole book of Isaiah. And today we are up to chapter 30. So this is in the midst of the woe chapters. So you see Isaiah, while the book of Isaiah is not in chronological order, you could see it's in somewhat of a topical type order it is divided up into groups so we had for example our burden chapters and then we had our parenthetical chapters between the burdens and the woes and now we are in the midst of the woe chapters all right so the woe chapters began at chapter 28 and i want you to notice a running theme of the woe chapters see if you can see this theme so chapter 28 it was a woe to the drunkards of ephraim and in general to people who uh, partake of alcohol or any type of chemical substance that makes them not sober. All right, and how that messes up the relationship with God or our potential for relationship with God. All right, chapter 29 is woe to Ariel. And then we find out that uh, Ariel uh, gave lip service to God. They went to church. They did his festivals and whatnot, but their heart was far from him. It was all just for show and was not authentic. So now here in chapter 30, it starts with, Woe to apostate sons. Now, sons here is not a, a gender indicating males. Uh, sons here means children. So some translations rightly translate this word children, which is correct. So sons in the Young's literal translation only refers to male uh, people uh, if we have a context or a qualifier with it indicating that specifically referring to sons versus daughters, for example. But uh, here, as in many other places in the scriptures, when it says sons, it's actually referring to children. So it means everybody. Okay, but notice it says, woe to apostate sons. Now, some people teach and believe that apostasy is not in the Bible, and that is absolutely wrong. This is one of the places where apostasy is in the Bible. And uh, the word apostate means to willingly fall away from or to purposely turn away from. So, woe to the apostate sons are referring to people who willingly fell away from the grace of God, who purposely and knowingly turned from God. So is there apostasy in the New Testament? Absolutely. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the scriptures tell us about things that have to happen before the middle tribulation rapture occurs. And one of the first things that's supposed to happen is the falling away. So falling away is translated from one word in the Greek, and that Greek word is apostasia, where we get our English word apostasy. So see, here we see woe to apostate sons. So we had the drunkards who uh, were seeking hedonism and uh, highs and drunkenness instead of the one true God. We had the fakers who said that they were following the one true God, but they actually were not in their heart and actuality. Now are the apostate sons, the ones who are willingly and knowingly going against God. So, chapter 30, verse 1, Woe to apostate sons, the affirmation of Jehovah, to do counsel, and not from me, and to spread out a covering, and not of my spirit, so as to add sin to sin. So, these apostate sons, these people who turn away from God, who specifically in this chapter is referring to the house of Judah, but you'll see that this chapter has moral implications for all of us today, and that this chapter gives prophecy that is now our history, but was prophesied to them, but it also dips into prophecy that is our uh, future that hasn't happened yet for us as well. And it says that uh, they do counsel, but not from God. They're taking counsel of men, but they're not taking counsel of God. And they're spreading out for their spiritual covering, not the Spirit of God. They're spreading out worldly things for their spiritual covering. 
Verse 2, who are walking to go down to Egypt, and my mouth have not asked to be strong in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. So instead of being strong in the strength of God and entrusting in the shadow of God and the shadow of his wings, right? Instead, they're going down to Egypt. So the Assyrians, uh, they saw the Assyrians take down the house of Israel. Uh, the Assyrians are going after the house of Judah, and Judah is very concerned. But instead of rightly turning to God and taking counsel from him and trusting in the covering of God's protection, they are eschewing God, and they're taking the matters into their own hands, and they're going to go down to Egypt to see if they can get their protection there. And that's why God says, my mouth have not asked. And God's saying, I didn't tell you to go to Egypt. Egypt. Why don't you listen to me? I'm sending you prophets telling you what's going to happen and what to do, but you aren't listening. Verse 3, And the strength of Pharaoh hath been to you for shame, and the trust in the shadow of Egypt, confusion. So you can have the strength of God by trusting in God, but they're trusting in man. In this case, they're trusting in Egypt. So that's what's bringing them shame. And they are not putting themselves in the shadow of the wings of God. They're putting themselves in the shadow of Egypt. And that's just bringing confusion. And God is not an author of confusion. You will never get confusion from Jehovah God, the one true God. Verse 4, For in Zoan were his princes, and his messengers reached Hanes. These are Egyptian cities. Verse 5, All he made ashamed of a people that profit not, neither for help nor for profit, <clears throat> but for shame and also for reproach. So that just continued on saying, Don't be trusting in Egypt. House of Judah, you should be trusting in God. Don't be trusting in Egypt, viewer, be trusting in God, where Egypt symbolizes the world. Don't be trusting in the world, be trusting in God. Verse 6, the burden of the beasts of the south into a land of adversity and distress, of young lion and old lion, whence are viper and flying seraph. They carry on the shoulder of asses their wealth and on the hump of camels their treasures unto a people not profitable. So instead, they're trusting in Egypt, in the world, in man. So they are putting their burdens on their camels, loading them up, packing them up, and going on down to Egypt. But they don't find rest in Egypt. <clears throat> it shows that Egypt has... It's, it's a land of adversity and distress. It's like meeting a lion in the wilderness or a viper or a flying seraph. And a flying seraph uh, could be a form of a uh, fiery, poisonous serpent that lunges at you so fast they fly at you. Verse 7. Yea, Egyptians are vanity, and in vain do help. Therefore I have cried concerning this, their strength is to sit still. So God was trying to tell them through the prophets, no, stay there, don't go into Egypt. Yet some are still fleeing to Egypt, but God would say, no, stay there. Because the Assyrians did for a time take down Egypt. That was not a safe place. The safe place is by resting in God. Verse 8, no, go in, write it on a tablet with them, and on a book engrave it, as it is for a latter day, for a witness unto the age. Folks, this is the latter day. The record that they were told to write down is for us today. And uh, we'll actually look at a few scriptures in the New Testament that parallel some things coming up in this chapter with latter days that match today. So the, the, it's, it's being told, okay, we're going to keep a record of these sons of rebellion, these apostate sons, these people who are trusting in man instead of trusting in God, because there is a massive moral lesson in there for us of today, us here in these latter days. So now we are reading the record that they were told to write down and keep. And here it is. Unless you think this record is skewed over the years, it absolutely is not. The uh, Isaiah from the Masoretic Manuscripts, the most trustworthy ancient manuscripts out there, has more evidence for it than any ancient book ever written under any genre. And then when they found the Isaiah scroll in 1947 and 1948, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Lo and behold, it matched the Masoretic text. The scriptures have not been corrupted over the years. They have been preserved as God promises in such places as Psalm 12, verses 6 and 7. Verse 9, that a rebellious people is this, sons, that means children, liars, sons not willing to hear the law of Jehovah. So these, these rebellious people in Judah at that time and many people most, 
people of today, even the ones who call themselves Christians, are liars. And they don't want to hear the words of God and follow God's ways. Verse 10, who have said to seers, ye do not see. And to prophets, ye do not profit to us straightforward things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Turn aside from the way. Decline from the path. Cause to cease from before us the Holy One of Israel. Do you know your scriptures? Does this sound familiar? Because this parallels latter day scriptures in the New Testament. So, we're going to quickly turn to two of those passages. So let's turn to the first book of Timothy, chapter 4. 1 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 1 through 2 says, And the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times shall certain fall away, apostatize, they shall fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and teachings of demons. In hypocrisy speaking lies, being seared in their own conscience. They actually break their own conscience. Hedonism, seeking after false teachings of demons and doctrines of devils instead of after the one true God. Yes, you can break your conscience. Now let's also turn to the second book of Timothy and also chapter 4 in the second book of Timothy. But here let's look at verses 3 through 4. And those say, for there shall be a season when the sound teaching they will not suffer. That means they won't allow it. But according to their own desires to themselves, they shall heap up teachers, itching in the hearing. And indeed from the truth, the hearing, they shall turn away. And to fables, they shall be turned aside. Just like Judah, they didn't want to hear the words from the seers and the prophets telling them the truth about God. They wanted to hear stuff that made them feel good, that made them feel like they were special, fabulous, amazing people, that, made, that justified their sins. They didn't want to hear that they were living a sinful, hedonistic life and that God was calling them out of that. No, they wanted to hear that you're fabulous just the way you are. You do you, boo, right? Okay, so resuming in Isaiah chapter 30, we are up to verse 12, and that says, Therefore, thus said the Holy One of Israel, because of your kicking against this word, and ye trust in oppression and perverseness and rely on it, therefore is this iniquity to you as a breach falling, swelled out in a wall set on high, whose destruction suddenly at an instant cometh. So he said, okay, so you don't want to listen to the word of God. Then, you know, they did have the scriptures written on giant stone monuments that anyone could visit and read. And there was a lot more literacy then than a lot of people think. But you also had prophets and seers proclaiming the word of God. You could go on each Sabbath and hear the word of God read aloud as well. So they had no excuse. And now us in the latter days, we even less of an excuse than them. Because we have the written word of God right here. Most of us can read. If we can't, well, guess what? We have audio Bibles, too. We have teachings all over the place. And yet people aren't listening. Yet people don't want to hear the word. Because it doesn't tickle their itching ears that help them fulfill the desires of their flesh. So... You see or you break your conscience, eventually God's going to stop calling to you and instead he's going to send judgment and it will be swift, swiftly at an instant cometh, says the end of verse 13. So continuing on that note with verse 14, it says, And he hath broken it as the breaking of the potter's bottle, beaten down he doth not spare, nor is there found in its beating down a potsherd to take fire from the burning and to draw out waters from a ditch. So this parallels what we read in a previous chapter, that when judgment comes upon you, it's like you're ground to powder. So this is, this is saying the same thing. When judgment comes upon you, it's like you becoming a broken pottery bowl. But it's not just pot sherds that can be restored and glued back together. It's ground to powder. It is not fixable. Verse 15, For thus said the Lord Jehovah, the Holy One of Israel, that's another name for God, the Holy One, or the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest ye are saved, in keeping quiet and in confidence is your might, and ye have not been willing. So how do you get saved? 
in returning and in rest. In the Old Covenant, that means returning back to God and resting and trusting in Him and in His future Messiah who would save you from your sins. Looking back, us in the New Covenant means resting and trusting in God and in our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who paid for our sins. When we rest in God, that means we trust in God. That means when trials and tribulations and troubles come, we are quiet, as it says here. We are sober-minded. We have confidence in God, and we know that as His children, He will see us through. Notice it says, And ye have not been willing. Not willing to keep quiet and confident in God. Not willing. Okay, so verse 16, And ye say, No, for on a horse we flee, therefore ye flee, and on the swift we ride, therefore swift are your pursuers. One thousand, because of the rebuke of one, because of the rebuke of five, ye flee, till ye have been surely left as a pole on the top of a mountain, as an ensign on the height. There is a lot of fear and trembling to those who aren't in God. You don't have rest. You are a sitting duck. So this pole, this ensign, this sign, that is this writing that we are reading here that they were commanded to write down so that us of the latter times can see it and learn from it. Let's not repeat their mistake. Verse 18, and therefore doth wait Jehovah to favor you, and therefore he is exalted to pity you. For a God of judgment is Jehovah, O blessedness of all waiting for him. So we have two types of waiting in here. We have first, God is waiting for you. He is waiting for you to turn to him and rest in him. God does not force anyone to come to him. We are given free will, and that is part of how we are created in the image of God. Because in order to love God, we have to choose willingly of our own free will to love him. Else it's not love. We would just be automatons, robots, programmed to say it. But we wouldn't have any idea what love is. Because love isn't something that... Uh, is earned or paid for. Love is something that is freely given. And we are to freely give our love to God and to others and even to our enemies. Okay, so Jehovah God waits for us to turn to Him. And then blessings to us who turn to Him when we wait on God. God is a God of timing. Are you a true Christian? Do you have trials and tribulations and troubles? Wait on God. Rest in Him. It's all in the timing. Trust in God. Romans 8, 28, all things will work out for the good. But you need to be in God. You need to be in Christ Jesus. You need to wait and you need to trust. Verse 19, for the people in Zion dwell in Jerusalem. Weep thou not, weeping, pitying. He pitieth thee at the voice of thy cry. When he heareth, he answereth thee. If you cry to God earnestly, he hears you and he answers you. But you need to actually cry to God. Not be crying to God making deals with Him. Not be crying to God, but you still want to keep all of your hedonistic sins. You really need to turn to God. To turn to God means that you turn from your sins. And it gets into this a bit more in just a few verses here. Verse 20, And the Lord hath given to you bread of adversity and water of oppression. And thy directors remove no more, and thine eyes have seen thy directors. So in other words... You didn't turn to God. God's waiting for you to turn to Him. O oh, house of Judah, you rebellious ones. O oh, possible watchers and listeners of this video. O oh, the latter end days of the world right now. Do you have adversity, trials, troubles, and tribulations? Well, stop turning to your fellow man and turn to God. Verse 21, this is a promise. In thine ear heareth the word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Go ye in it when ye turn to the right and when ye turn to the left. Because when you turn to God, then you have God's Holy Spirit within you. So you don't just have your conscience, which hopefully you haven't burned and broken, but you have an additional inner voice, being the Holy Spirit of God. And that's where the book of Ephesians in the New Testament talks about upon the moment of salvation, when you choose to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins in your place, and you receive that free gift of salvation, and you want Jesus to be the Lord, master of your life and you want to live for him then you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise verse 22 and ye have defiled the covering of thy graven images of silver and the ephod of thy molten image of gold thou scattereth them as a sickening thing go out 
thou sayest to it. So when you truly turn to God, you truly turn from your sins. In this case, those of Judah who truly turn to God, they throw their idols out. They all had household idols to their false gods. But when they turn to God, they don't want those idols in their house. Get out of here, you sickening thing. I'm throwing you out. I don't want to be anywhere near those religious relics of destruction and damnation. So how does that work for us of the latter days that this is written for, for us to learn from? That when you turn to God, if you've truly turn to God and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you have turned from your sins. Whether those be sexual sins, whether those be sins of drunkenness or other chemical substances, whether these be sins of scamming and lying or of hate and deceit, whatever the sins are, you eschew them. Get out of here, you disgusting, filthy things, because I want to live for God. Throw those idols out of your life. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my words in John chapter 14. If you love Jesus, then you should be eschewing your sin idols and doing what Jesus teaches. Verse 23, and he, and he, that's God, hath given rain for thy seed, with which thou dost sow the ground and bread, the increase of the ground, and it hath been fat and plenteous. Enjoy to thy cattle in that day an enlarged pasture. So it's going through a list of blessings that God rains down upon his children who turn to him, who throw out the idols of their life, and who wait on God and trust and rest in him. So, Continuing on with more promises, verse 24, And the oxen and the young asses serving the ground, fermented provender to eat, the one is winnowing with shovel and fan. And there hath been on every high mountain, on every exalted hill, rivulets, streams of waters, and a day of much slaughter and the falling of towers. Why did it mention on every high mount? Because they had their high places where they had idols to their false gods, such as Moloch and Baal, etc. By the way, those are uh, the false god that was born on December 25th. Jesus was born around September 29th. Okay, but instead it's saying, on every high mountain uh, are rivulets and streams of water. And then it says, in a day of much slaughter and the falling of towers. Now this is transitioning to our future as well. Okay, so now this is transitioning to the Battle of Armageddon, which happens at the end of the seven-year tribulation, all right, in a day of much slaughter and the falling of towers. And then that turns into the day of the Lord because Jesus Christ comes back during the Battle of Armageddon and us, his saints, who are raptured to be with him in the middle of the tribulation, come back with him. All right, uh, and also though, and at every high mount there shall be exalted uh, high hills and rivulet streams of water. Uh, we read some inklings of that in the book of Revelation. And then continuing, we see it's transitioning into the millennium of peace, verse 26. And the light of the moon has been as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun is sevenfold as the light of seven days. And the day of Jehovah is binding up the breach of his people, when the stroke of its wound he healeth. So... Well, I don't know what spectrum this light is going to be, but we have nothing here to indicate that this is symbolic, that the moon will be brighter, that the sun will be much brighter, yet it seems to bring blessings and not harm to us. It seems to help our crops grow better. Uh, it seems to bring health and vitality. So I don't know what spectrum that is. Remember, there's certain light spectrums that have various different effects. Uh, different frequencies of different lights can actually uh, heal various forms of cancer and illnesses, for example. Okay, verse, and then notice it says, when the stroke of its wound, he healeth. Could be these light spectrums coming from the uh, new light from the moon and the added light to the sun. These are healing light spectrums, bringing healing to the nations during the 1,000-year millennium of peace, which happens after the Battle of Armageddon at the end of the seven-year tribulation. Verse 27, Lo, the name of Jehovah is coming from far, burning in his anger, and great the flame. His lips have been full of indignation, and his tongue is as a devouring fire, and his breath is as an overflowing stream unto the neck it divideth, to sift nations with a sieve of vanity, and a bridle to causing to err is on the jaws of the people. 
So Jesus comes back, his second coming during the Battle of Armageddon. It says here to sift nations because the ultimate fulfillment of that is at the Battle of Armageddon, it's all these nations coming up against the Jewish people at uh, Har Megiddo, at the Battle of Armageddon. So these nations will receive their judgments. But this is also telling us that this chapter is to all people, not just the house of Judah or the Assyrian slash Ashur, but to all people as a warning you will receive swift judgment from the righteous judge if you continue living in your sins and hedonism and don't turn to him. Because God is a God of integrity and of righteousness and of judgment. He must do the right thing. Verse 29. Singing is to you as in a night sanctified for a festival and joy of heart as he who is going with the pipe to go into the mountain of Jehovah, that's Zion, and to the rock of Israel. And cause to be heard hath Jehovah the honor of his voice. And the coming down of his arm he doth show with the raging of anger and the flame of a consuming fire scattering and inunda inundation and hailstone. For from the voice of Jehovah broken down is a sure. With a rod he smiteth. So, two fulfillments here. The fulfillment that was prophesied then that already happened, and the fulfillment that's prophesied that hasn't happened yet. Ashur is another word for Assyria. So, is prophesying that Assyria would receive its judgment, and Assyria did receive its judgment. But it's also using Assyria or Ashur symbolically, symbolizing the nations that turn against Zion, against Judah, and that uh, those nations will receive their judgment just as Assyria received its judgment. Verse 32, And every passage of the settled staff that Jehovah causeth to rest on him hath been in tabrets and with harps, and in battles of shaking he hath fought with it. For arranged from the former time is Tophet. Even it for the king is prepared. He hath made deep, he hath made large, its pile as fire and much wood. The breath of Jehovah as a stream of brimstone is burning in it. So let's break this down a bit, okay? From the former time, arranged from the former time is Tophet. Tophet is a name for the Valley of Hinnom. It's part of the Valley of Hinnom. And the Valley of Hinnom was their trash dump. And there was so much trash and compost there that uh, it was burning and on fire. Uh, you know, we have a uh, compost dump uh, somewhat nearby. And uh, for a time, I, I called it Gehenna because it burned like the Valley of Hinnom. It had caught fire and it took so long, days and days and days, before the fire was finally successfully put out. So the Valley of Hinnom, or Tophet, uh, became, uh, because the fire is just always burned, uh, became known as uh, hell. And uh, that's where we get uh, the Hebrew word Gehenna from. And Gehenna is uh, the lake of fire and brimstone. It is the third compartment of hell. So a range from former time is Tophet. Tophet here is referring to hell. Even for it, the king is prepared. So hell is prepared for the king. But the New Testament says that hell was prepared for the devil and his fallen angels. Therefore, this king must be a devil or a fallen angel. Well, this king is Satan. And Satan, during the middle of the tribulation upon the deadly head wound that Antichrist receives, Satan heals and embodies Antichrist and becomes his driving force. And that's why suddenly in the middle of the tribulation, Antichrist is able to do magical, wondrous, amazing, almost like superhero type things because he is driven by Satan. And we read in the book of Revelation that during the 1,000 year millennium of peace, Satan is locked up in the second compartment of pit, that, uh, of hell, the outer darkness or the pit known as Hades or Sheol. And then after the 1,000 year millennium, he eventually gets cast into the Gehenna, the lake of fire. For a range from the former time is Tophet. Hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. For even it, for the king, Satan is prepared. He hath made deep, God hath made deep. 
He, God, hath made large its pile as fire and much wood, so its fire doesn't go out. The breath of Jehovah as a stream of brimstone is burning in it. It is the ultimate judgment of Satan, the great adversary. Satan means adversary. So this chapter, what is the moral of this chapter? Each of these woe chapters has a moral. What was the moral of uh, chapter 28? To be sober. Otherwise, what's the New Testament say? If you're not sober, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, will devour you. So what is the moral lesson of uh, chapter 29? It is, you can't just do lip service to God or just go to church and do charitable things if your heart isn't actually for God. And then we tie that in with today's chapter, chapter 30, which talks about you can't, if you turn away from God or you're rebellious and you put your trust in man, then God is going to bring his judgment upon you. But first he gives you time to turn and return back to him. So one, make sure you're actually saved. And to get saved means that you choose to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins in your place. And then pray to God and tell him that you received that free gift of salvation. And then if you really love Jesus, you're going to want to live for him and you're going to want to live the way that God designed us to live as much as we can in this fallen world. So on your Christian walk, learn to eschew sin and to walk the path of righteousness. And we learn about that from God's holy word, the Bible. That is why he gave it to us. So two... If you are a professing Christian, make sure it's with your heart as well and you're not just giving lip service, but that it is the real deal. Because remember, Jesus said, Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done all these things in thy name? And then God will say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Lip service, not heart. Make sure your heart is in it as well. And have a blessed day.